the whole internet of value can be in one place with shared security. Under the hood, there's these modules, but these are integrated modules. And we only buy into one security assumption, which is that Ethereum is secure. And this brings us to you know, trying to grow the economic security of Ethereum. Right now, we are at $70 billion, which is extremely good. It's 29 million ETH times the price of ETH. But you know, I'm hopeful that we'll get to a trillion dollar of economic security or even trillions of dollars, at which point you know, we'll have unquestionable security even against nation states. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Fixing fragmentation. Ethereum rollups have a fragmentation problem. All the liquidity is spread out. Each rollup is starting to feel a little bit isolated. That has been the critique of Ethereum the last six months, and I, I don't think is an unfair critique. The question is, how do we fix it? Can we fix it? There are certainly Ethereum skeptics out there that think Ethereum is destined to always remain fragmented. That is the trade-off with going to a roll-up-centric roadmap. That's what Ethereum is on right now. But we have Justin Drake on the podcast today who takes the other side of that. Not only does he think Ethereum will fix fragmentation, also it will achieve the holy grail, something that he calls universal synchronous composability. Now, don't worry, we explain what all of that is as we get into this episode. There are three parts to it. Number one, we talk about the problem, fragmentation. Why is it a problem? Who is impacted by it? Number two, we talk about the solution, that is shared sequencing and what that means. And number three, we talked about based sequencing, why Justin Drake thinks Ethereum layer one will become the de facto shared sequencer. This in itself was an incredible insight for me, something I just uncovered in the last two weeks or so, and seems relatively fresh from Ethereum researchers as well. There are a few core ideas that Justin really brought together in this episode. First is really how shared sequencing provides the platform, not the solution, but the platform for achieving universal synchronous composability. Really, once we achieve shared sequencing in Ethereum, the game starts. That is not the finish line the rest of the solution, the solution space for synchronizing all the chains is left up to uh, accessory technologies like intense market makers, restaking. But really, shared sequencing unlocks the door for us to, to therefore walk through. Also, another idea, why rollups will all inevitably join together via the incentives that shared sequencing brings to the table. And once we have this, how this unites the Ethereum rollup development towards a single unified direction. Once again, in Ethereum, we will have a unified direction for all of the layer twos because all of the layer twos will start to feel and look and be one global unified system. And then I think lastly, one of the very, very big takeaways I had from this episode, Ryan, is why all of this would result in an increase in scope for Ethereum's layer one validators. That's if we do get to the based sequencing part of this uh, future. So if you are a validator, uh, you could and you might have increased responsibilities and increased yields as well. Uh, so these were some of the three big ideas in this very, very big episode that Justin Drake brought to us today. Yeah, and I would say as far as content level, this is probably 300 level material 300 here. 300 plus, that, yeah. Yeah, 300 plus. And so we tried to uh, break it down for you. David, maybe we'll talk during the debrief uh, in, in some layman's terms what, what this kind of means. But the, the essential, the, the 100 level content is Ethereum feels like it's many different chains today and it won't mm -hmm. in the future. That is the bottom line of this episode. Yep. And Justin Drake explains exactly how. So this is frontier material. Of course, the kind of content you come to know and expect from Bankless. We're going to get right to the episode with Justin Drake. But before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this possible, including our recommended exchange for 2024, that is Kraken. If you haven't created an account, if you're new to crypto or if you're in crypto and you don't have a Kraken account, you absolutely should get one. Open it today. Kraken knows crypto. Kraken's been in the crypto game for over a decade. And as one of the largest and most trusted exchanges in the industry, Kraken is on the journey with all of us to see what crypto can be. Human history is a story of progress. It's part of us, hardwired. We're designed to seek change everywhere, to improve, to strive. And if anything can be improved, why not finance? 
Crypto is a financial system designed with the modern world in mind. Instant, permissionless, and 24-7. It's not perfect, and nothing ever will be perfect. But crypto is a world-changing technology at a time when the world needs it the most. That's the Kraken mission, to accelerate the global adoption of cryptocurrency so that you and the rest of the world can achieve financial freedom and inclusion. Head on over to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payward Ventures, Inc., PVI, doing business as Kraken. You know Uniswap. It's the world's largest decentralized exchange with over $1.4 trillion in trading volume. You know this because we talk about it endlessly on Bankless. It's Uniswap, but Uniswap is becoming so much more. Uniswap Labs just released the Uniswap Mobile Wallet for iOS, the newest, easiest way to trade tokens on the go. With a Uniswap wallet, you can easily create or import a new wallet, buy crypto on any available exchange with your debit card with extremely low fiat on-ramp fees, and you can seamlessly swap on Mainnet, Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism. On the Uniswap mobile wallet, you can store and display your beautiful NFTs, and you can also explore Web3 with the in-app search features, market leaderboards, and price charts, or use Wallet Connect to connect to any Web3 application. So you can now go directly to DeFi with the Uniswap mobile wallet. Save simple custody from the most trusted team in DeFi. Download the Uniswap wallet today on iOS. There's a link in the show notes. Are you launching a token? Is it already live? How are you managing the legal and tax obligations for providing token grants to your team? It's no secret that token management gets complicated. Between learning all the legal language and tax obligations in every country that your team is in, token grant management can feel like an obstacle course, but it doesn't have to. That's where Toku steps in. Toku provides practical tools to handle token grants, allowing for effective oversight of token distributions and payroll tax compliance for employees, contractors, advisors, and investors. They also handle tax withholding through their real-time tax calculations that can be done by Toku or integrated into any payroll EOR providers in any jurisdiction. Toku is a trusted provider of Protocol Labs, DYDX Foundation, Mina Protocol, and many more. Get started for free and make token compensation simple at toku.com slash bankless. Bankless Nation, I'm so excited to bring you Justin Drake, a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. He needs no introduction, but if I were to give him one, I would say he's the guy who brought us Moon Math, our episode about how Ethereum is scaling with cryptography, ultrasound money, how ETH is sci-fi money, MEV burn, and how all MEV on Ethereum will ultimately flow into ETH. And now, today on the show, he comes to us with a new problem and a new solution. Fixing fragmentation is the topic of today's episode. Justin, welcome back to Bankless. It's always a pleasure to have you, my man. David and Ryan, thanks again for having me. So Justin, people are saying Ethereum has a problem. Liquidity... UX, wallets, chains, all of our infrastructure is fragmented. Uh, while one of the beautiful things about the uh, roll-up uh, centric roadmap for Ethereum is that we all get to innovate and experiment in different directions, these different directions are, of course, different from each other. One of the costs is that this breaks the universal composability that we used to enjoy on the Ethereum layer one. It is getting harder to use Ethereum holistically today more than ever. This is the current state of things. Is this where we end up? Is this the future of Ethereum? What say you about this current uh, context about Ethereum's uh, trajectory? Well, first of all, I do want to acknowledge that we do have a problem with uh, fragmentation. And as you said, it boils down to a very large extent around this idea of composability. Each layer two is kind of its own little silo right now. Um, and we, while we do have bridges, those are asynchronous they're slow and they're somewhat brittle and, and very difficult to, to use. Now, the good news is that um, you know, a lot of people have been thinking about how to fix this, and I think we can fundamentally fix it with something called shared sequencing. So the, the root cause for this fragmentation of composability originates from the fact that we have different entities called sequencers that are ordering transactions for little clusters of execution. So we have the Arbitrum cluster, the base cluster, the Optimism cluster. Now, it turns out that shared sequencing in and of itself is not sufficient, but it's a necessary step to get to try and regain this uh, universal composability. And when I say universal composability, I specifically mean universal synchronous composability. So synchronous means that kind of things happen at the same time, things happen atomically. It's as if uh, you have contracts ar called arbitrary other contracts in other execution domains. Um, so one of the big upsides of having this universal 
synchronous composability, as you mentioned, is that we get, we get things like unified liquidity, as opposed to the status quo, where we have these fragmented pools of liquidity. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. We get so much more with uh, universal shared, shared composability. Okay, Justin. So you, you kind of um, you, we're we're setting up the problem a little bit, and we're going to talk about um, kind of the the solution, the holy grail, which is this this um, term that you've been using called universal composability. And that for the normie crypto user is a mouthful. Universal composability. What the heck does that mean? Let let let's just try to break this down into kind of layman's terms when we're, we're, we're talking about the, um, the problem of fragmentation uh, today, uh, let's call it. So in a lot of ways, Ethereum is like much easier to use than it has been. Um, but in some ways, it's like more difficult. When you tell someone who's new to crypto, yeah, just use the Ethereum network. Like they might be like, oh, I see that one. Is that the one with really expensive fees? I'm not using that. And then you say, no, you can go use... Um, Optimism, Arbitrum, ZK Sync, Polygon, like on down, right? And they're like, well, which one should I choose? How do I get started? I remember in the early days of Bankless, when we were talking to someone about getting on chain for the first time, the answer was pretty easy. Like you had kind of one option. You just go to Ethereum. There's no other network selections inside of MetaMask. You can kind of live there. You don't have to worry about bridging assets. The only bridge you had to make was going from a centralized exchange like a Kraken or a Coinbase uh, on chain, on Ethereum. And that, like that was it. You could kind of live there. Now, uh, the L2 roadmap has essentially asked Ethereum users, including the newcomers, to go pick a layer two. And that's caused some confusion because what if the app that I want to use isn't on the specific layer two that I'm on? And I don't want to use Ethereum mainnet because it's too expensive, but like, what chain, what chain do I use? And the UX around this, the liquidity around this, it's, um, it's difficult. So what's happening is, I think we've seen this a lot in the second half of uh, 2023 is com like competitors, Ethereum competitors, let's call them, or alternative layer ones, are seeing this soft underbelly of Ethereum. And they're basically saying, look, come to this monolithic chain. We got it all here. You just go on chain and everything is universally composable. So an app from like one place in uh, an alternative layer one, like a Solana, let's say, or, or an Avalanche, it's available to anyone who is on that chain. So th that's kind of what we're talking about, just to, just to set up the fragmentation problem is the UX and liquidity uh, issues that, that exist today in Ethereum in its current form. And I think you're acknowledging that. I'm, I'm just like wondering, high level, as we get into the rest of the episode, was the move to the layer two roadmap, is it worth this cost? Because we're feeling some pain right now. And I, I just wanna uh, acknowledge that and talk about that. Right, so I'd say that the move to layer twos was absolutely necessary. Uh, and the reason is that otherwise we move too slowly. Like the layer one is extremely slow to move forward. It's extremely ossified in some sense. Uh, and you know we have these extremely high standards of quality to ship things at layer one. So we could have rollups at layer one. Actually, those are called native rollups. Uh, but in order to, to do so, we would have, for example, to have a ZKVMs, but not just one ZKVM, but multiple redundant implementations of a ZKVM that are redundant, that are battle tested over years. Um, and, and this is just something that we don't have right now. And so in some sense, like this Ethereum accelerationism in the short and medium term comes from these layer twos that permissionlessly uh, can can de deploy things and 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 move Ethereum forward, um, while you know the the, the layer one uh, gathers what it needs to 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 ship. The good news is that a lot of this fragmentation, as I said, is is temporary, and I think there's kind of two fundamental reasons. One of them is that a lot of the details around fragmentation can be abstracted away. Right? Like when you use the internet, there's a lot of different brands behind it. There's a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, you can wrap everything up and like just present a very simple, shiny user interface to, to the user that abstracts away a lot of te technical details. And then there's something else, which is something much more fundamental, which cannot be like papered away and abstracted away, which is the difference between asynchronous composability and synchronous composability. That's like a, a key differentiator. And what synchronous composability means 
is that if I'm a smart contract, I can go call any other smart contract and things will happen atomically. So if I'm building a very complex application, let's say that I'm building a marketplace. A marketplace needs identity, it needs a reputation system, it needs payments and escrow agents, and it needs insurance providers. Now, if all of these money Legos are on execution zones with different sequences, then now suddenly your application becomes extremely brittle because everyone, every time you want to interact with it, you're interacting with different counterparties and composability starts to break down in a very meaningful way. Whereas if we have this one shared sequencer which unifies everything, then it's this one entrance door to this very complex world which can be you know, extremely rich and diverse, um, but it's this it, it's a real unlock to go from asynchronous composability to synchronous composability. Now, I used to uh, you know, be one of those people who would say asynchronous composability is fine. And you know, part of the reason is that Ethereum previously had this roadmap with sharding where we had 64 or 1024 shards, which were asynchronous. And to be fair, in hindsight, it was kind of cope. Um, <laughs> You know, I was optimistic <laughs> that we could paper over uh, with abstraction. Wait, 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 uh, but Justin. I, I, so researchers get cope too? Because I know crypto investors get, get cope. <laughs> I had no idea that researchers actually get technical cope. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we have various constraints. And then, you know, we just do the best that we can with, you know, the laws of crypto economics. Um, I mean, dank sharding was a, a massive unlock, right? Because dank sharding basically says that we can do synchronous data availability. We don't have to break data availability down into these asynchronous shards. And not only can we do synchronous data availability, we can do synchronous composability, and we can do this synchronous sequencing. So we can do everything sequencing uh, synchronously. And in some sense, we're getting the best of both the modular thesis and the monolithic thesis, right? We're getting all the efficiency and the user experience of the monolithic thesis, but behind the scene, we have all the richness and diversity and decentralization of the, mono, of the modular thesis. I really want to parse apart this um, spectrum that I see between synchronous composability and asynchronous composability. I, I see a spectrum that is also a binary at one end. So asynchronous composability can be a very large spectrum where we have like on an optimistic roll up, we have a seven day withdrawal window. So seven days to like perfect finality. And so that's a very, you know, very asynchronous, you know, seven days worth of t multiple networks not being totally in sync with each other, you know, past that seven days, then, you know, some of the state can become, you know, permeate across chains after seven days. Um, then in ZK rollups, it's much faster. Uh, ZK, ZK proofs are just settle onto the main chain much, much faster, but still they are not synchronous. They're still asynchronous change, uh, but you know they settle inside of like one to three blocks, you know, just a few minutes. So still asynchronous, much shorter amount of time, slower, uh, lower amount of time for these chains to like sync up with each other. You know, Uniswap trades will take a. Uh, on one ZK rollup will take less time to affect a Uniswap trade on a different uh, ZK rollup, but it won't be instantaneous. And then you flip over to the binary, which is like perfect uh, atomic synchronicity. Uh, and this is uh, what I think you are saying, like requires new infrastructure uh, that you're labeling as shared sequencing and probably some additional stuff on, on top of that as well. Is this is this the, the right spectrum to to illuminate this conversation moving forward? Yes, that's exactly right. So on the one hand, we have a continuum of latencies, or the worst case right. is you know, seven days, and then we can try and bring that down. And actually, one of the requirements for synchronous composability is real-time settlement. And it turns out that the only way to get real-time settlement, which is the ability to read and withdraw from uh, rollups immediately, is to have a ZK rollup. And not only do we need a ZK rollup, but we need a ZK rollup with real-time proving, essentially being that when the CPU runs uh, and executes transactions, there's some sort of coprocessor running behind it that in real time produces a, a snark that proves that the CPU is doing correct execution. And we are not there yet, but we know how to do it theoretically. And in my opinion, it's just a matter of pushing the, the engineering. So two things that we need to do is, one, improve the engineering of recursive proofs. So that allows us to parallelize the proving. And two, we need to have 
hardware acceleration, and in the end game even have snark ASICs. So once we have this real-time proving, we've basically brought the latency down to zero for settlement. But if you have two chains that each have zero latency of settlement, that's not enough to actually get synchronous compatibility. You need the final step, which is you need one single actor who has a monopoly power to do things at the same time synchronously on both sides. So let's say that I want to buy you know, $10 million of some token. And in order to get best execution, I'm going to need to get liquidity from multiple different pools. Um, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to the shared sequencer. The shared sequencer is going to have a look at all these pools and say, yes, in order to fulfill your order, I'm going to go dip in all these pools. And the cool thing is that this one entity, this one counterparty can give you very, very, very high assurances um, that it will be able to in one fell swoop, kind of complete your order, and not only that, also give you a pre-confirmation. So that's another aspect of shared sequencing, is that you have this one counterparty that can, in real time, give you promises of future execution, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to having to wait for the 12 second block time or whatever the block time is. As I've grown in my understanding about the role of centric roadmap, I always kind of understood like, oh, uh, asynchronous chains going in different directions. We get a diversity of different strategies. This is good for Ethereum because all strategies get to be experimented with, let the best strategy win. Uh, we get multiple different solutions to the same problems. And then also in response to the like lack of the fragmentation critique, um, my answer has generally been along the lines of like, well, latency towards finality will slowly come down over time and it will approach zero. It won't actually get to zero, which is zero I would consider to be uh, atomic transactions, atomic execution, universal composability, but it will approach zero. You know, chains will get faster. Uh, optimistic roll-up settlement times will approach zero. ZK roll-up settlement times will approach zero. And we will get so close that kind of what you were saying, a browser on the internet, you know, in the back end of a browser, you have many different asynchronous systems that compose the internet. You know, fun fact, the internet is an asynchronous system. And the browser just packages it all up and presents it to the user. And, you know, it's so close in terms of finality and settlement and latency that just like from the end user, it seems good enough. And so that was kind of my idea about how the role of centric roadmap will come to be composed together. We will just get so close that we can get just like UX tricks, front end UX tricks to take us the rest of the way. But I think Justin, what you're saying was that, well, that was the cope that you were talking about. That was like the, the sharding of the Ethereum roadmap. And actually it's true atomic execution, true universal composability. That is what we are uh, that we ought to be striving for and aspiring to in, in the Ethereum future. And I think you are also saying we can get there. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and I, I guess an alternative phrasing could be, it is possible that, you know, very similar to the internet, we could do everything asynchronously and just wrap it up. But it is a, mm. a superpower. It is a luxury that, you know, we could potentially get synchronous composability. And I think that, you know, we as a, an ecosystem, we can't afford to not, you know, pick up the fruits of this luxury. And part of the reason is that we have competition, right? If we don't do it, the, the competitor will do it. And in some sense, Solana is forcing us, you know, through better UX, better composability to, to just move a little bit faster. Uh, so, you know, hat tip to Solana for, for, for doing that. But one of the cool outcomes of this accelerationism from Solana is that now we finally realize that we, we, we can do you know, credibly neutral, extremely secure, with pre-confirmations, um, shared sequencing for, for all of Ethereum, and basically mimic the user experience that Solana has. Okay, um, super cool so far. You know, that that hat tip to, to Solana is kind of interesting because one of the my favorite things about the crypto ecosystem is like, we're all leveling each other up and like one chain's innovation becomes another chain's area of improvement and kind of their level up potential. We've seen that with so many things. And so I just want to establish what we're saying as, as we're, we're going into this episode. So Justin, you are saying there are some advantages with this thing that um, we're calling here universal synchronous composability. So USC, and we'll get into those advantages and enumerate them a little bit more in just a second. But I wanna make sure that we are definitionally sound 
on universal synchronous composability because it sounds like tech techy like words. It sounds like eth, uh, researchy words, but like breaking this down, universal I take to mean across all chains. So like everywhere, and not just you know like one Ethereum. It's Ethereum plus all of the the rollups, all of the layer twos, and all of the layer threes. That's what universal means. And then synchronous means everything stays in sync. So at the same time, okay, that's what synchronous means, I think. And then composability means you can stitch things together. So all of these money Legos, they're not, um, you know, kind of like across the chasm where you can't stitch one money Lego with another money Lego. All of the money Legos kind of fit together. All of the smart contracts talk to one another and you can stitch them together inside of another, you know, uh, million dollar word here, you can stitch those together in an atomic transaction. So that is atomicity. So like one single transaction can stitch all of these things together. That's what we mean by universal synchronous composability. And we are saying that is good. If we can have that, we want to have that. Now the internet gets by without having that. It's an important di distinction. You can build something like the internet with just universal asynchronous composability, but we are saying we like universal synchronous composability. If you can have that, that's the cherry on top and you get a lot of benefit from that. Do, <laughs> is that a, a good kind of working definition or what would you modify? No, I think that that's exactly right. So if you want to have a, you know, a look, a feel for what universal asynchronous composability is, have a look at Cosmos because that's the whole vision, right? It's own chain Every chain uh -huh. is its own asynchronous shard. And arguably, you know, things are extremely messy in Cosmos land. And, you know, Cosmos people will tell you that. And then the other extreme is, of course, Solana, where everything is under one, one umbrella. But, you know, Solana has made a lot of shortcuts, um, which, you know, Ethereum is not willing to make. And what I guess I'm trying to say here today is that we can get the best of Solana without taking shortcuts. Um, so it will take some time, it will take several years. So that is the main trade-off. Like we have slower speed of execution, but the end game, the North Star, is that we can get the exact same user experience, if not better, than Solana today. There's a bunch of um, quirks, idiosyncrasies, I think, that uh, people experience when they use Ethereum and its rollups today. Um, there's one Uniswap per chain. Uh, MetaMask has a dropdown for all these different chains. Uh, we, there's doing this this bridging. Can you maybe you can just tell us a story, Justin, of uh, you know fast forward five, however many years that we need to wait until we have this, you know, the research and then the engineering done on this. What does a universal synchronous uh, Ethereum feel like and look like to a user who knows Ethereum as it is today, where there's multiple networks, multiple Uniswaps, uh, different like tokens with prefixes in front of them? Like, what are the, some of the big pain points that would be gone in this scenario? One of them is that you have shared liquidity across every single rollup. So right now we have a bit of a, a cold start problem for, for rollups, right? They're starting from scratch and they can't tap into the half a trillion dollars of liquidity, you know, on, on, on layer one. They have to start from, from, from zero. And this is very expensive for several reasons. Like one of them is that they have to redeploy all these contracts, which start off empty, and then they have to provide incentives for people to move over. So you have to pay for li liquidity farming. And then you have to set up infrastructure like, like Chainlink, right? So you have to set up these business deals uh, and you need to do all sorts of new integrations. And so the, the barrier to entry for new entrants is, is extremely high. So in addition to having you know, unified liquidity, we also dramatically lowering the the friction for, for innovation. So one of the consequences, for example, is that we can expect a much richer long tail of, of virtual machines. Because right now, you know, the, the main rollups are in some sense opinionated. They say, okay, we're gonna go with AVM equivalents. But what if you wanna innovate a little bit more at the virtual machine layer, have things that are specialized for one thing or another, and also have them you know, compose with the existing ecosystems. In, in some sense, what I expect fundamentally is just much more richness than we would have otherwise. Um, but you know, today, arguably, the, the, the user experience on any given um, silo, on any given execution zone is actually pretty good, right? You have the, the 
the, the pre-confirmations on Arbitrum and you know you have a, a, an existing ecosystem, but it would be so much better, there would be much less deadweight loss, more network effects if everyone were to work in, in, in the same direction. Now, one very important uh, distinction, I guess, is around whether or not we can tap into the existing you know, half a trillion dollars of liquidity at layer one. Because oftentimes when people talk about shared, uh, shared sequencing, they talk about shared sequencing for the rollups, for the L2s, so that they have interoperability between them. But what about the L1? Well, it turns out that we can have both. Like we can be in a position where instead of playing zero sum games with the layer one, we're actually boosting the layer one. And every time a new entrant comes in, that grows the pie incrementally and incrementally. This is uh, every time uh, we have you on, Justin, it, it's kind of like a conversation where uh, that I love because you always come to us with uh, good news. Like, it's kind of like, hey guys, you can have your cake and eat it too. Right. And like when, when we did our episode that David alluded to in the intro, you know, um, about cryptography uh, magic, it was, it was kind of like that. And uh, many of the other episodes, it's been kind of like that uh, as well. It's just like... The theme of all Drake episodes is, <laughs> hey, we can use cryptography to get what we want. Yeah, exactly. Which is why I love it. And like one thing I really want right now is what you, what you mentioned, which is shared liquidity. Just to put a, wrap a bow around that for the user, that, that basically means that the user experience would be like, like one inch or matcha or any kind of DEX aggregator, except across all layer twos by default. Like that would be easy. Right now you can kind of get by a little bit with um, Intense. So like, you know, yeah, Uniswap's Intense uh, your platform, if you use one inch today, they're, they're doing some of that uh, with Intense. But what you're saying is we would have that by default if we get to this uh, special place of universal shared uh, liquid synchronous compo uh, composability. But also another thing that's bothering users, I think, is bridges. Are you also saying that like in this world, bridges go away? Because there, there's a, another set of questions every time you want to move your asset from one layer two to another or from Ethereum to a layer two, you're like, what bridge do I uh, trust? And there have been so many famous bridge hacks, right? Many of these bridges are like nothing more than multi-sigs. And it's scary out there. Do bridges go away if we, if we achieve this dream here? Right. So bridges exist to bridge a gap. And if you remove the gap, as you said, you, you no longer need the, the bridge. So you have bridgeless bridging, if you will. Now, as you said, today's bridges are like really suboptimal, you know, from a security standpoint for two reasons. One is that they tend to be fairly complex. Like sometimes, you know, you, we're talking about light clients, like passing messages back and forth and like fancy cryptography, but also just from a, a governance standpoint, right? They have their own governance token. They have, you know, potentially multi-sigs, even most of them. And we've seen historically that many, many bridges kind of got completely emptied. When we have universal synchronous composability, you just call the other contract uh, without a bridge, just like you're doing today, you know, at, at, at layer one. So that's definitely a, 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 a big gain. Another, I guess, improvement is in terms of deduplication and, and defragmentation. So right now um, we have lots of different Uniswap pools, for example, one per, per rollup. And it's, it's actually gas inefficient to go you know, dip into each one individually. It would be okay to have one single pool that makes everything more gas efficient. And actually this is why a Uniswap chain actually makes sense, right? It doesn't make sense to have a Uniswap chain which has its own sequencer, right? Because then it's kind of this big pool of liquidity but you can't really tap into it. You don't have this composability. But now if we have Uniswap as an app chain which is synchronously composable with all of Ethereum, then it's as if it was a, a smart contract. Right? It's arguably it's just it's just an app. So we're we're moving up one level of abstraction, but we're not really changing things. Can we talk about just um, things like ENS, uh, for, for example? I mean, yes. one thing that bothers me about my RSA.eth name is I don't have it by default on all of the different layer twos. It, does that become available? Like, how about? you know, um, all of the ratings and reputation, let's say, that, that it seems like base, the, the roll-up is, is trying to uh, accrue. And, you know, there's fantastic, um, uh, like, 
e- each of these rollups seems to have almost a, an economic zone of specialization. And I just want to bring that competency from one chain to the other anywhere that I go inside of the, the Ethereum ecosystem. Can I, do I get things like ENS across all of the chains with uh, universal synchronous composability? So the current roadmap that we're on is let's create these new L2s and these new rollups and migrate all the assets from one place to another. Now, that has two big problems. Big problem number one is that there's some assets that you just can't move or just realistically won't move. If you take ENS, for example, that, that you know, the root of trust, more likely than not, will always be Ethereum layer one. And same for like immutable NFTs like, like CryptoPunks or whatever immutable application there is on layer one. It's very difficult to, to move these assets. And then if you think of whales, right, that are extremely conservative and, and, and whatever, like funds and treasuries, like that is going to stay on, on L1. And so we're risking a, a situation where, you know, we have like a, a winner take most roll up and then we have the L1 and they're both kind of 50-50 or some, some, some share of, of, of the market. And this is really bad for network effects. And the reason is of Meltcalf's law, right? Meltcalf's law, roughly speaking, says that the, the strength of the network effect is quadratic in the size of, of, of the network. Um, and so if we have 50-50, that's actually like a 4x loss of potential strength of network effects, right? Because we've reduced the size by two, and that means the, the network effect has reduced by, by a size of, of four. So that's, that's one problem, is that the, the mere like, m- migration problem is destructive to, uh, to, 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 to network effects. To summarize this section, we've been talking about just a lot of the the costs of fragmentation. Where Ethereum is supposed to be a place where we have positive sun games, the roll-up centric roadmap hasn't yet fit into that model. Like if just like you said with Metcalf's law, just in you know adding on another roll-up takes away liquidity from other roll-ups. Right? It's one plus one does not equal two. It's actually one point one equals. 1.8 1.8 or 1.7. There, there's loss there when new rollups come into the field because we have to share limited finite resources. Whereas I think the future that you are illustrating that we're trying to get to is that if a new rollup comes onto the scene, it's actually additive. It's actually greater. Any sort of new capital or TVL that a new rollup attracts brings it into the grander superstructure without pulling it from other rollups. If optimistic rollup chain number 74 comes in and then, you know, Uniswap deployment number 82 comes in and then it, it attracts, you know, a million dollars of TVL, without universal synchronous composability, it probably attracted TVL from other chains. And so for the holistic system, it wasn't additive. It was just, you know, we just took from one pocket and gave it to another. But I think with universal synchronous composability, this flips where any single new chain that comes on with another version of Uniswap or even the Uni chain, which is the grand centralization of all liquidity, any new system adds to the throughput of the Ethereum network. It adds to the liquidity of the Ethereum network without pulling away. So it, it goes back into positive sum games where with, some, with the technologies needed to produce universal shared composability, one plus one can equal three, which is one of the reasons why we are in crypto in the first place. So would you say that's kind of the, the outcome we're searching for? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Like the, the competition between rollups that don't have shared sequencing is not just zero sum, it's negative sum, because we start mm. to break down these you know, super linear network effects. And then as soon as we reestablish the network effects, we go back to this, you know, quadratic, super linear um, power of the of the network effects. And I think this is, you know, part of the the way that I think about it is that Ethereum is going through its, its you know puberty phase. Things are a little awkward, like things get hairy, um, <laughs> and <laughs> um, and you know the, even this also has impacts mimetically right the, the voice of ethereum the narrative is changing right people are feel like you know there's 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 insider fighting you know people people feel a little lost right it's it's um, roll up uh, versus roll up a little bit right and it's all of these kind of sub brands like if i'm on arbitrum and i am i on ethereum right we used to know right. when you were on ethereum like it said ethereum and it was very clear but and and then and then there's all of the layer twos kind of competing against each other. So we've lost some of the shared spirit 
Like there's been some fracturing in terms of uh, narrative, in terms of brand, in terms of this feeling of, of oneness. It's almost like, you know how so often we use uh, the, the metaphor of um, a, a country like the United States. And, uh, you know, one metaphor we've used is like Ethereum being kind of like uh, the United States, let's say, and all of the states being kind of these individual rollups. It's almost like the... The, the states themselves are at war with one another, not in a healthy economic competition, which they should be, but like almost part, not part of the same, uh, like, like, I guess, group of um, states that are forming a, a union together. And, and that's where we're kind of left as of today. So you think the process of getting the architecture right and universal composability, you think that could heal? Uh, what we're seeing on the on the narrative and, and mimetic warfare side? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think this is more than just a technical innovation, as is usually the case with Ethereum. This is also some sort of social shutting point, a coordination point, something that the whole community can, can rally around. And I think there is a large amount of risk if we don't find this, this common ground, uh, this neutral playing field, which is that we have gigantous ecosystems. We have titans, you know, like Arbitrum, like Optimism, that are, you know, decabillion projects, right? Like tens of the market caps, these market caps are huge and they have huge amounts of, of, of weight behind them. And we don't want to see these titans fighting each other, otherwise it's going to, it's going to be extremely bloody. And there's going to be a lot of unnecessarily, unnecessary loss of, 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 of network effects. And so what I, what I think we should do is kind of try and understand what is a reasonable thing to compete on and what is a reasonable thing to collaborate on. And where I personally draw the line is on shared sequencing. I think kind of for the, for the sake of the industry, if you will, um, shared sequencing is something that we really want to collaborate on. I think of it as a trillion dollar dance, right? If we can get this right, we're unlocking a trillion dollars of, of value. Now you can ask, okay, what are the the rollups really competing on then well there's a whole like list of things that they can that they can compete on they can compete on tooling they can compete on virtual machines they can compete on tokenomics and public goods uh, they can compete on on security they can compete on biz dev there's just so many things they can compete on but you know for the love of god don't compete on on sequencing and the good news is and, and, that and Justin, what are they not competing on? So they're not competing on sequencing and they're not competing on liquidity anymore? Or are they still competing in liquidity for liquidity? Aha, uh -huh, great question. So this goes down to the, the incentives at play, right? Like how do rollups make money? And the way that they make money is through execution. And 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 not, and not sequencing. And we can we can go down this this whole rabbit hole. And so really what the rollups want to be doing is maximizing the amount of execution within their execution zone. And one, one way to do this is, as you said, to, to compete for users, compete for liquidity, compete for devs. And that's totally fine. But the important thing is that this competition is healthy because it doesn't you know, break the pie, it grows the pie. So it's this really healthy competition that, that, that we want, not the unhealthy one where we have these negative sum games and we're breaking down network effects. Justin, we've been talking a lot about what could be, what the Ethereum that could be when we achieve universal uh, synchronous composability. Um, we actually need to technically answer how we actually get there. Uh, you've been talking a lot about uh, shared sequencing. And I think that is uh, the first step on perhaps a multiple step long journey of technical advances that Ethereum needs to achieve, the Ethereum rollups uh, need to achieve in order to have this universal shared composability. Is that the right way of thinking it? You know, shared sequencing is step number one, and that provides the foundation for the following steps. But first, we need to get to shared sequencing. Is that is that correct? Right. So there's two necessary ingredients in order to get to the end game. One is shared sequencing, and the other one is real-time settlement. And for both of these like fundamental pillars, we're not there yet. Um, the good news is that even if we have shared sequencing, but we don't have a real-time settlement, we can still do a, a lot of stuff. It's just not, not the end game. So for example, if we're dealing with optimistic rollups where you have to wait seven days, like what you can still do is use liquidity providers that will mimic synchronous composability and kind of will, will bridge 
bridge the liquidity gap, as it were, because it takes seven days to get your liquidity out. Right? Imagine that you want to buy $10 million of a token, you get optimal pricing across lots of different pools all synchronously, but then it takes seven days for you to receive your, your money. You wouldn't be super, super happy. Use LPs to, uh, to, to, to bridge this gap. But once we have real-time settlement and shared sequencing, we're, we go back to this very luxurious model, very simple for developers, by the way, it reduces a lot of, of mental friction. And, and, and besides the, the mental friction aspect, there's also this uh, entrepreneurial risk going on, right? Because right now we're asking application developers to make you know, big bets, to put all their eggs in one basket on one provider. And this is, this is somewhat you know, risky. And one of the nice things with um, you know, universal composability is that you can do these graceful migrations and updates from one, one app to another. So the, maybe the best example is Uniswap. Right? Uniswap has no governance. It's a fully immutable smart contract. And it's been able to seamlessly upgrade from V1 to V2 to V3 precisely because all of these versions of Uniswap are under the same sequencer. So from the point of view of a user going on the website, the Uniswap website, whenever I click buy, you know, behind the scenes is just buying from all these pools at the same time, and it just feels uh, seamless. But the reason why Uniswap doesn't have a similar buy button for all the rollups is because it's just so much more complicated and messy and, 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 and brittle. And so for developers, now we've, we've reduced the entrepreneurial risk, we've reduced the cognitive friction, and we're, able, we're going to be able to move to move so much faster. Just really quick, reduce the entrepreneurial risk because the developer doesn't have to pick a winner. Like I, I imagine if you're a developer today, you're like, what chain do I deploy on? What chain do I focus on first? And that's like, there's a lot of questions in that. You're saying it removes that risk? Yes. And not only are we asking... It, it goes back to just choosing Ethereum rather than choosing Optimism or choosing Arbitrum or choosing Polygon, it goes back to just like, oh, I, I choose to build on Ethereum, correct? Yes, at least for this one layer of the stack, which is the sequencer, right. which is some sort of very important public good layer that we should all coordinate on. Okay, real-time settlement and shared sequencing. These are the two big uh, upgrades that we need to, uh, to bring to Ethereum. And these aren't upgrades like proof of stake or EIP-1559. We're not talking about an EIP here. These are actually more extra protocol upgrades and real-time settlement, that's not even just a specific innovation. That has got to be a collaboration between faster roll-up settlement times. So maybe the transitioning to ZK roll-ups. It's also um, faster like intent fulfillment uh, orders, better market makers. And so there's a semblance of extra protocol things contained in that real-time settlement. But then the first one, I think that really is where the, um, a lot of the magic happens is, is shared sequencing. Can we just go back to the 101, Justin, of what is sequencing? Uh, how does sequencing look today on Ethereum's rollups? And then we'll get into what does it mean to share that process? So the way that chains, traditional chains are designed is that at any given point in time, at any given so-called slot, you have a well-defined entity, the sequencer, who has monopoly power to include a block in, in that slot. So in L1, we have this rotation of the sequencer, and it's the proposer, the layer one proposer. At the rollup level, what we have today is centralized sequencer, so that at every single slot, it's the same entity. And you know, more often than not, it's just the the labs or the team behind this specific uh, rollup that are running the, the sequencer. Now, one of the desires of these teams is to move to a, a, a decentralized sequencer. So, you know, sooner rather than later, we're going to be in a position where we're also going to have this rotation of the, of the sequencer at any given uh, slot. But the important property is that at any given point in time, you have this one actor who has monopoly power uh, for for a short period of time, and then that they can give you like promises uh, on on future execution, which is basically a pre confirmation. So, you know, a lot of of the of the time people complain about Ethereum's lock times being quite long. You know, twelve seconds it's an eternity. Well, we're going to move to a future where whoever the sequencer is. Uh, will be able to give you a pre-confirmation on the order of 100 milliseconds because 100 milliseconds is roughly the amount of time it takes for you know things like information to travel on the internet. 
And not only are we going to have pre-confirmations like we do right now on the rollups, but we're also going to have layer one pre-confirmations. So one of the, the great things about everyone working on, 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 on the same sequencer, if that happens to, to be the R1, is that the, the various um, pieces of infrastructure for users, the, the wallets, the searchers, the builders, all of that whole pipeline around going from a, a transaction to a user will be upgraded. And one, one way to, to think about it is just to add the, the, the prefix uh, super to every single actor. So we're going to go from transactions to super transactions. We're going to go to uh, builders to super builders, searchers to super builders, uh, super searchers, um, you know, PBS to super PBS. And what super means is that you know, we're touching multiple execution zones at the same time. So a super transaction is a transaction that touches multiple zones. So there needs to be some upgrading of the wallets, you know, from transactions to super transactions. But this is, you know, much, much easier than uh, shared sequencing, which is more of a co social coordination game. You know, it's this dance that we have to play. Uh, and real-time settlement, which is this really hardcore, uh, you know, engineering problem. Okay, so just just setting up the landscape and maybe repeating some things back to you. So every rollup today um, has a sequencer, and the sequencer's role is basically to do uh, determine what transactions go inside of of the block and and then to order that. And these the the sequencing and all of the rollups, I think basically all of the rollups today, is managed by a centralized team. So if you're on Arbitrum. It's kind of like the Arbitrum people, it's Arbitrum Labs, or, or some sort of entity that is operating uh, the sequencer. And the reason that's fine in the rollup architecture today is as a user with funds inside of Arbitrum, you always have the option to withdraw your funds back to the Ethereum layer one. So you can't have that form of rug risk. But, but you do have some risk with respect to, I, I suppose, censorship. You know the the centralized se sequencer can kind of you know censor your transactions, and then you have like liveness risks, which we've seen. So when the centralized sequencer goes down, then like the chain stops working, you can't get transactions through. So you so you have these risks. That's the current state today, and I think there's been some social notion like that we want to make our rollups more decentralized over time, right? That would be, I think. Um, congruent with crypto values, with Ethereum uh, values. And so we're, we're maybe on the path to do that. But I want to ask a question on this, Justin, because there could be a trap here and that might be an incentive trap that might slow us down or, or stop us. And that's like, I'm aware of many decentralized um, sequencing, shared sequencing solutions out there, right? There's, there's one called Espresso. Uh, there are many others. Um, but there is kind of like a profit incentive thing at play where the sequencer not only sequences the blocks, they don't do it for free. In exchange, they get MEV. So they get basically blockchain uh, fees. And that goes back to the entity operating the sequencer. So in effect, by inviting a shared sequencing solution inside of your chain, you are foregoing some of that profit. You're giving it to someone else. I, I'm, I'm wondering if you could kind of address that. Has that been a reason we haven't seen more shared se sequencing propagation uh, thus far? Uh, and if so, how, do, how does that impact uh, kind of the, the, you know, the, the social layer that you're talking about and our ability to get shared sequencing done? Right. That, that is a fantastic question because as everything we do in our space, it's, it's driven by incentives. So it's, it's really important to appreciate the incentives. One of the things that I want to clarify, first of all, is that the sequencer today on, on the rollups is a collector of fees. It's not a generator of value. And the reason is that, it, it, largely speaking, it collects two different fees. It collects the layer one data fee for you know, data availability, and really the, the value creation is the layer one. And it collects the layer two execution fee. And here, this is a, a think of it as a fee like the EIP-1559 base fee. You know, it's, it's native to the execution engine. It's non-negotiable. You know, the sequencer basically is collecting these two fees and then forwarding them, you know, as expenses to the sequencer. And so the, the sequencer is not really making, uh, you know, m m much profit. Now, you're right that fundamentally the sequencer can charge fees, but it's not really fees, it's actually MEV. It's a fantastic question to ask, okay, 
the existence of MEV is that an impediment to everyone playing this trillion dollar dance uh, because we're all incentivized to kind of not play it. And I have several uh, you know, answers to that. One is that the rollups today are not extracting MEV, right? They don't want to extract MEV. And part of the reason is that MEV is kind of extractive to users. So one of the really cool things about uh, a centralized sequencer is that it provides MEV protection. It's kind of this super easy encrypted mempool. So for example, there's no sandwiches on, on Arbitrum and on Optimism and on Base, right? Because you send your transaction privately to the centralized sequencer, no one else can see it, and so no one else can go sandwich you, right? And so in, in you know, trying to, to, to extract MEV, now suddenly there's a, a real trade-off, like the user experience just becomes, you know, so much worse. And I think in our, in our ecosystem, you know, we want to try and go to the up and up and up. And, you know, users have become addicted to pre-confirmations, and I think users will also become addicted to MEV protection. They're not going to want to, to go back. But let's assume that, you know, we do go back just because, you know, the incentives are, are so large that, uh, that we do, uh, we, we do want to go back. Well, let's try and quantify the things. And maybe the best place to look at is the, the L1, right? Because we have a very robust uh, fee market. And here, what we're seeing is that uh, on L1, we have 800 ETH per day of MEV and 3,200 ETH per day of base fees. So on layer one, the ratio, I guess, of execution fees to MEV is, you know, four to one or, you know, 80%, 20%. And so really MEV is, is, a, is a small part today on L1. And then the, I guess the, the, the third point that I want to make is that I believe that MEV is going to go down by, by an, at least an order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude. So today the, the breakdown is 80-20, but in the future, I believe it will be more like 99%. 1%. And the reason is that today there's two main sources of, of MEV. One is sandwiching, and I think that will just go out, you know, will go away completely with things like encrypted mempools. And then the other source of MEV is, is arbitrage between decentralized exchanges and centralized exchanges. And again, here with, with better application design, we're going to be able to remove the leakage of MEV to the sequencer. So the basic idea in one sentence is that these new like you know v4 uh, decentralized exchanges are going to be able to auction off the right to arbitrage and then with the proceeds of the auction rebate the liquidity providers if you didn't understand that it's not it's not a big deal but the the, the point that i'm trying to make here is that the mev will no longer flow to the sequencer and so really the way that i think about it is that the best move for the rollups is what I call the MEV gambit, right? They're going to be giving away, let's say, 1% of their revenue, right? Because almost all their revenue will be execution fees, 99%, and 1% will be MEV. And in exchange, they get to tap into this wonderful, wonderful ecosystem of, of composability. Yeah, so, so just to like um, recap where we are right now. Again, we're on this quest to solve fragmentation yeah, and the the... The way we solve that is getting universal synchronous composability and shared sequencing can help us get there. And Justin, you think that there is a positive incentive for all rollups to add shared sequencing to their stack, because while they might lose some MEV, MEV is not a sustainable revenue source for them anyway, given market forces, and the trade-off will be worth it because they want to make their revenue on their value proposition, which is execution. And uh, they get so much more execution if they get the um, liquidity and composability and bootstrapping effect and Metcalf's law and everything we've talked about of the entire force of the Ethereum economy. So they're all going to add shared sequencing to their rollups, uh, you, you think? You think the path is clear for that? Let, let me ask you, like, why haven't they already? Is the shared sequencing tech not here yet? And for, for those that aren't aware, there are like a handful, I would say, of shared sequencing uh, providers. Espresso is one that, that kind of uh, comes to mind. But to my knowledge, that's like not in production in any chain yet. Like we haven't, we don't have shared sequencing across the chains. But again, once we get that, 
we get universal synchronous composability, at least I believe. So why don't you think we've, we've gotten there yet, Justin? What's stopping us? There's so many reasons why we, we, we haven't got there yet. One of them has to do that with the, this, just the, the sheer simplicity of centralized sequencing. It's the, the easiest way to just get a foot out of the door. And we've seen how important it is to be a first mover. Right? Optimism, you know, they just wanted to be a first mover, for example. They just went with the simplest approach possible, which is let's just have a, a shared sequencer. And you know, they've even made the trade-off of not having four proofs. Um, and that, that's fine. You know, it's kind of a, a business uh, you know, a strategy and you know, it, it worked out really well for them. Another kind of aspect of this, this shared sequencer, which is fully controlled by the team, is that it's actually a security training wheel. And very few people appreciate that. So here's the problem. A lot of the verifiers, whether it's a snark verifier or fraud proof verifier, they're extremely nascent and they're gonna have bugs. And if an attacker wants to go exploit, for example, a snark verifier bug, well, what they would have to do is kind of craft this you know, invalid block and make it look like it's invalid to the verifier, and then they get to steal money. And so if we have a centrally controlled sequencer that acts like security in depth, because the, the, the shared sequencer that's controlled by the team will make sure that no you know, invalid and crafty blocks ever make it on chain. And so in order to exploit a bug, you need to do two things. One is you need to take over the shared sequencer, and two is you need to you know, exploit the, the, the verifier. And then another reason, which I've already mentioned, is that these uh, shared sequences act like an encrypted mempool. They provide uh, MEV protection. And then mm. another kind of aspect of this is that, you know, we need to build a lot of infrastructure, right? I was talking about all these, these super things, like we need to build super builders, super searchers, all of these things. And the, the great news here is that, you know, the market will will build this through proposal builder separation like the the sophisticated set of builders will go ahead and, and do that but we still need wallet integrations and things like that and then we we also have the incentive point like people don't really understand the incentives of shared sequencing today and to be fair you know some of them some people are very very skeptical of shared sequencing precisely because of MEV. And today, you know, MEV is a, is a sizable share, right? It's like an extra 20%, like who would want to give up 20%? And so I think we need to see more maturity. We need to prove to the market that MEV is indeed going down by an, an order or two orders of magnitude. And then at which point it will kind of become, become a no brainer. And so I think like the, the roll up teams are keeping optionality uh, right now. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, worth saying is that the roll-up teams just have so much on their plate, right? Like they have to, you know, going back to like the cold start, they have to incentivize liquidity within their pools. They have to do all the chain in, in integrations. They have to do the MetaMask integrations and all of that stuff. And it's, it's, it's really, really complicated. And so a lot of that actually goes away, ironically, once we do have <laughs> synchronous composability. So let's take Chainlink, for example. Um, Chainlink today, what they're doing basically is trying to uh, get a business deal with every single rollup, right? Because you need Chainlink oracles for DeFi. Like in some sense, they, they, they have a monopoly, but this is really at the expense of rollups. And my understanding talking to various rollup teams is that what's happening in practice is that there's these backroom deals uh, that are protected by NDAs. And it's like, we're talking about like very large amounts of money that in some sense, like the chain link is able to extract from these rollup teams. But if we if we had Oracle updates on L1, and we had everyone had synchronous composability with L1, then tada, you know, you just get chain link oracles for free. No need to pay this additional chain link tax at as an L2. Yeah, and problems like that are rampant across the the layer two space. Um, Etherscan, for example, charges a fee for every single rollup. Uh, and you know, what if uh, we just we could get more synchronicity, more universe, uh, universality with a lot of these different vendor providers that are able to uh, copy and paste their business model across every single chain when it all kind of coheres down into into one single chain, at least from the UX perspective. Justin, we've gone pretty far in this conversation, and I don't think we've actually yet done a pretty um, thorough walkthrough of a shared sequence. 
Uh, so maybe we can talk about like what happens in a shared sequencer paradigm when a Uniswap transaction on Optimism collides with a Uniswap transaction on Arbitrum. Uh, right now, these these two transactions do not talk to each other. One only impacts the other. Once some liquidity provider arbitrage bot settles and bet rebalances the pools across these two different chains, can you uh, just walk us through a shared sequence? Uh, how what is it? We you know we're talking about the sequencers, the orderings of transactions on Arbitrum, the orderings of transactions on Optimism. But when we get to a place where these things are sharing their sequencer, uh, what does that look like and what does that get us? Because I think we really need to define this foundation for our, how these rollups can compose together after we have a shared sequencer. So maybe we can start from the beginning of defining shared sequencing and, and what does that look like across rollups? So when we have a shared sequencer, there's one well-defined entity, the shared sequencer, who has monopoly power to build blocks for all the rollups and all the L2s simultaneously, at least those that have opted that, that in. That integrate with it. That integrate with it, yes. So on, on that right. note, universal is maybe overselling it, right? Because it's not completely mm. universal. It's whoever opts in to this shared sequencer. Right. Uh, but what I think will happen is that there will be a de facto default. And so by default, you have universal composability. But if for whatever reason, you know, you want to have your own application specific sequencing, then and that's fine. You can go ahead and, and do that. The, the, the shared sequencer is not forced uh, on, on, on anyone. Now, let's say that we have N rollups that have opted in. Well, this one entity can build blocks for these end rollups at the same time. And not only can they build end blocks, but they actually have the ability to build interleaving blocks. So you could imagine calling rollup A and then rollup B and then rollup A again and then rollup B again and then C and et cetera. So basically you can think of it like 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 threading the needle between all all, all these uh these these virtual machines and having an, an, an interleaved interaction, just like you can have you know, contract A that calls contract B, that calls contract C, and then you know, goes back to contract A, for example. Now, in the case of a, you know, a, a Uniswap trade, what will happen is that the Uniswap front end would be you know, monitoring the liquidity on the various executions, and then it would craft for you, you know, something that maximizes the, the, the efficiency of, of your execution. And it will turn out that, you know, in order to maximize efficiency, you need to touch roll up A, B, and C. And so what it will create is a super transaction, which is made out of three constituent transactions. And you have like very nice properties. Property number one is that all three of the constituent transactions will all happen at the same time or none of them will happen. So you have atomicity. And then you have this other really cool property is pre-confirmations, which is that you know immediately you know, whether or not your transaction will go through. You don't have to wait you know, 12 seconds. And also, you know, so both, not only do you know immediately your execution price, but you also know, you know how much you're paying on, on, for gas in, in every single uh, uh, rollup. So we're, we're kind of going back to this Web2 user experience, but, but using, using Web3 tools. Okay, so there's got to be some amount of computation going on here. So say I make like a decently large Uniswap trade on Optimism on the ETH USDC pair, and it is uh, so large because my size is size that it also disturbs the Arbitrum Uniswap pool as, as well uh, because because of some arbitrage mechanism. Uh, and there's some computation going on there. I would imagine that if we are living in a shared sequencer paradigm. Uh, that computation is happening atomically, and that is improving my execution price. But also, a market maker and or an MEV bot or an arbitrager is also coming in and helping me rebalance that pool to optimize for efficient efficiency. And their transaction is also coming in. Is that is that happening as well, or is that the role of the sequencer? Who's doing that job? This is like slightly of a different problem, but it's basically you know, yeah. some sort of order flow auction. Like I, as a user, I want best execution. What I will do in the future is not what's happening today, but in the short-term future, what will happen is that you're going to talk to various searchers and the searchers will be competing with each other to give you the best quote. And then you just pick, pick the best quote. This is kind of what's happening with, with, with Uniswap X. You have the searchers right. competing to give you the best quote. 
And the amazing thing here is that it's the market that's doing all the, you know, computational combinatorial searching, right? Because there's there's like an exponential blow up of different combinations of like of of pools and liquidity, and all of that is handled by the sophisticated searchers and builders. So that is part of the beauty of proposer builder separation. The sequencer who's given the right to sequence doesn't have to do the heavy lifting computationally. Mm. Um, they can delegate that right to entities that will that will do the heavy lifting. And the amazing thing is that even though the builders and searchers will be very sophisticated, you know, it might be some sort of army of PhDs with a very large cluster of computers, that ent sophisticated entity is totally trustless. Okay, so with this process of, you talked about like how this is like uh, in the uh, world of Intense and Uniswap X, that's how I understand it as well. And, and all of these um, in, uh, intent transactions that are being made by the user and then being f uh, filled by fillers, they all collapse down into the centralized sequencer and become atomic because of the centralized sequencer, correct? Right. Um, like the, the searchers are able to give the user uh, a deal which can be signed off by, by, by this one counterparty, which is the, the sequencer. If you have you know, 16 different sequences, then now it becomes extremely messy because now you need to try and gather some sort of pre-confirmation from each one of them. But you know, some subset of those 16 might, might not respond or be faulty in some way. So all we need to get to this state of uh, super transactions and super bund bundles, and again, this prefix super, which I, I, I love, it, uh, that's like kind of a transaction or a bundle that... that touches multiple execution environments or like effectively multiple chains in this world. Do, do we also get uh, the layer one as part of this? Like, because, you know, so my understanding is all of these layer twos, all of these rollups will need to adopt the shared sequencer, kind of the same shared sequencer, right? And, you know, it's not truly universal because they all have to opt in, but they all, let's let's assume they all opt into this one uh, shared sequencing solution, right? Then we get, uh, a t universal synchronous composability across all uh, all of the rollups. We also get that with the Ethereum uh, main, main chain, uh, or is something else needed there? Right, fantastic question. So the the nice thing about the rollups is that they have the ability to opt in, right? Because they have a, a governance and they can basically choose which sequencer they opt into. The L1, unfortunately, is what it is. It just it can't opt in to something other than what what it currently is. And it happens to be that the sequences of the R1 are the layer one proposers. So if you want to be synchronously composable with the L1, you have no choice. You have to hire in some way the L1 proposers. And um, you know, and by it's, proposers, it's been, just to just to translate, validators, stakers, yes, like we're talking exactly. about the, the the people who run clients, right? ETH clients. Yes, that's correct. There is a proposed upgrade, which is called execution tickets, where the proposers are a different entity. Uh, but let's put that aside for now. Let's just say that it's, it's just validators that are currently sequencing the L1. If you want synchronous composability between rollups and the L1, like the rollups kind of need to buy into the sequencing of the L1. And this is what's called based sequencing. And if you opt into base sequencing, you become a based rollup. And there's all sorts of advantages to being a, a base rollup that, that opts into base sequencing. One of them is that you inherit the censorship resistance and the liveness of Ethereum. So not only do you have the settlement guarantees of Ethereum, but you also have the censorship resistance, the real-time censorship resistance, not, not the delayed one you know, with the escape patch, but the, the real-time one. And that has like various consequences. For example, it means that you have longevity of your chain. Let's say that as a rollup, um, you know your sequencer gets taken over, fifty-one percent attack, and you know the sequencer can't be changed. Then now all the users have to use the exit hatch and and and, and move out. So that's one advantage of, of of base sequencing is security. The other one is credible neutrality. And you might say, you know, do we really care about credible neutrality? Uh, well, if you're one single rollup ecosystem, not really. But if you want your competitor to, you know, also opt in, it needs to be credibly neutral. You can't have the optimism 
you know, ecosystem say, hey, we, we've created our own sequencer. It's credibly neutral. Please, Arbitrum, come use it and vice versa. Like there needs to be some amount of credible neutrality, some sort of common ground that we can all agree to, to adopt. And the, the, the nice thing is that in some sense, Ethereum is, is maximizing for these two properties, security and credible neutrality. It's almost the definition of a rollup, right? What, what is a rollup? A rollup is one that has already bought into the security assumption of Ethereum. You're not adding a new security assumption. You're not falling to a weakest link. You're just reusing the existing security assumption. And two is, you know, you've already accepted Ethereum as a credibly neutral platform. Otherwise, that you would have chosen another chain. And now you can go ask yourself, why isn't everyone just using the, uh, the, the layer one sequencing? And I think there's a couple answers to that. Number one is that, first of all, it's not obvious that the Ethereum layer one can be used as a shared sequencer. And this is a, a very, actually a very similar story to data availability. People spent like the better half of, a, of half a decade uh, to not realizing that data availability was just there, that it could be used for rollups. It was kind of this discovery of a new resource. And I think uh, the, the ecosystem right now with base sequencing is, is realizing that there's this new resource that's been there all along and that we can, we can start to tap into. So first of all, there's this lack of awareness. But um, the second you know, big problem is around pre-confirmations, right? Like it used to be the, the case that if you were to opt in to base sequencing, you inherit the 12 second block times and there's no pre-confirmations. But it turns out that we can get pre-confirmations and this is a very recent discovery. Basically what you can do is you can ask the next layer one proposer to be your pre-confirmer and because they have monopoly power to sequence things, they, they also have the power to provide you a pre-confirmation. So that ties in with, with restaking, for example. Basically, you have the layer one proposer put forward collateral and opt in to these new slashing conditions, which say, uh, if, if ever I give a promise of a pre-confirmation to a user and I renege this promise, I never honor this promise, then I'd stand to lose uh, my, my collateral. So we're starting to slowly understand and get all the pieces required for the L1 itself to have pre-confirmations. And then now suddenly you have this amazing shared sequencer, which has the pre-confirmations, which everyone wants, but also has maximal security and maximal credible neutrality. Mantle, formerly known as BitDAO, is the first DAO-led Web3 ecosystem, all built on top of Mantle's first core product, the Mantle Network, a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 built using the OP stack, but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle Network's gas fees by 80%, but it also reduces gas fee volatility, providing a more stable foundation for Mantle's applications. The Mantle Treasury is one of the biggest DAO-owned treasuries, which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming, and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRails. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. Celo is the mobile-first, EVM-compatible, carbon-negative blockchain built for the real world. Driving real-world use cases like mobile payments and mobile DeFi, and with Opera Minipay as one of the fastest-growing Web3 wallets, Celo is seeing a meteoric rise with over 300 million transactions and 1.5 million monthly active addresses. And now, Celo is looking to come home to Ethereum as a Layer 2. Optimism, Polygon, Matter Labs, and Arbitrum have all thrown their hats in the ring for the Celo Layer 2 to build upon their stacks. Why the competition? The Celo Layer 2 will bring huge advantages like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability secured by Ethereum validators, and one block finality. What does that all mean for you? With Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas natively using ERC20 tokens, sending crypto to phone numbers across wallets using Social Connect. But Celo is a community-governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forums, follow Celo on Twitter, and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum.
It's everyone's favorite season in crypto, tax season. And crypto tax is always an absolute headache, especially for all you DGENs out there. But it doesn't have to be a nightmare. That's where Crypto Tax Calculator comes in. The software built for DGENs by DGENs. As Coinbase's official global tax partner, Crypto Tax Calculator focuses on making complex transactions into easy ones, supporting over 300,000 currencies across Ethereum, Arbitrum, Optimism, as well as a thousand other integrations as well. It's as simple as connecting your wallet, pulling in all your transactions, and following the automated suggestions to quickly and accurately calculate your tax obligations. Plus, for all the airdrop farmers out there, Crypto Tax Calculator has your back as they are consistently adding support for new and upcoming layer ones, layer twos, and all the airdrops that you're currently farming. 2024 is the year when the DGENs do their crypto taxes with speed and confidence. Make taxes this year easy and affordable with Crypto Tax Calculator. Sign up at CryptoTaxCalculator.io and get a 30% discount with code BANK30. Click the link in the show notes for more information. Okay, I, I just want to chart um, that you know that we've I think starting to enter the third part of this uh, this conversation. So in the first part, we were talking about the problem of fragmentation and the benefit from getting universal synchronous composability. And the second part, we were talking about the way we achieve that is through shared sequencing. And at first, we were talking about the private market. Um, like solutioning for shared sequencing. And, and by private market, I mean kind of non-Ethereum layer one, just kind of the natural innovation. There is a problem. What is the, the problem? We have centralized sequencing. We want to decentralize that so that um, users get stronger safety, security, decentralization guarantees, and also to enable um, more composability and, and shared liquidity. And there are a bunch of like private market solutions that are spinning up to solve this problem. And Justin, you gave the case for why naturally the incentives align to kind of adopt these uh, solutions. And uh, I just want to get a timeline on, on that section. Do you think like private market shared sequencing, do you, do you think that will start to happen this year? Like when do we get that? Is that in the next six months? Is that in the next like two years? How long will that part take? Right. It's happening this year. So um, I've been having daily conversations now with uh, Ben Fish, uh, who's the, the founder of, of Espresso. And uh, you know he's he's really one of the thought leaders on on shared sequencing, and over the last you know week or so you know we've been trying to you know, share ideas and and align on 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 vision and it it I don't want to put words in his mouth but I think he's now convinced that you know base sequencing is the way forward so I think what we're going to start seeing is these you know market participants that were looking to provide shared sequencing kind of change their roadmap a little bit to just make it compatible with the L1 just because the the benefits are so are so huge. I see, I see. Okay, so I was I was teeing up kind of a private market solution with the the espresso type shared sequencers and then I I, I was thinking that based rollups and essentially hiring the proposers, you know, the validators and stakers of ETH layer one, maybe that is almost like a the public uh, solution, right? Which is basically like the, the Ethereum protocol saying, hey, use use us as a shared sequence. But these things tie together because the shared sequencer market can just not only provide shared sequencing across the rollups, they can also provide a based rollup type of solution where they're actually, and this I, I think is the thing I didn't realize until probably two weeks ago, you did an AMA, Justin, and the entire Ethereum research team did an AMA. And someone asked this very question, the, the question that, um, you know, like on Reddit, the question that this entire conversation is, is, is uh, based on, which is how do we solve fragmentation? And your big reveal here was that we could actually use Ethereum, like Ethereum Maidenet, as a shared sequencer. You said that's like hiding in plain sight. And and now you're saying that the shared sequencing solutions that are emerging in the market, they are starting to see that too. And now they can opt into using Ethereum itself, Ethereum mainnet, as a shared sequencer. So that's where we've gotten to in this conversation. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. And in addition to Espresso, I've been talking to three different team of entrepreneurs that are interested in shared sequencing. And for a period of time, there was frustration because people realized that uh, shared sequencing with pre-confirmations on L1 was theoretically possible, but we used to think that a hard fork was required. Specifically, we used to think 
that inclusion lists were required, which is a potential upgrade to Ethereum. But in the last few days, there was this kind of mental unlock where we realized, hold on, Ethereum L1 can provide pre-confirmations today, no hard fork required. And so now these three teams of, of entrepreneurs, add, in addition to Espresso, are excited to go you know, build it out. And so what I think will happen is you know, there's going to be a bit of a, a rush, you know, a race to try and, 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 and build this, this shared Ethereum uh, sequencer. And it's a little bit, I guess, like, um, like, like, like restaking, right? Um, Eigenlayer is not building, it, it's building the Ethereum restaking platform, right? It's not building some, uh, some proprietary thing. It's trying to tap into Ethereum. And I think what we're going to see is different protocols like Espresso tap into the Ethereum shared sequencer and enhance it in some way. And Espresso specifically is proposing like two really, really cool ways to enhance it. Way number one is that in addition to providing the economic, the economic security for pre-confirmations from one single entity, like this layer one proposer, we can actually also get the attestors, the firm attestors to just double on in terms of economic security. So if you have a, a layer one proposer that puts forward, let's say a thousand ETH of collateral, um, you know, that, that's a very good start. Uh, but what if you could have a million ETH of economic security for the pre-confirmation specifically, so for this 12-second window? Uh, that would be certainly an improvement. And then the other thing that Espresso is, is innovating on is the redistribution of, 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 of fees. So let's assume that my thesis around MEV is just completely wrong and that you know, the rollups will want to tap into the, the MEV. Well, Espresso is building a system whereby you can identify where the MEV creation came from, which rollup within the shared sequencer, and then rebate and kick back this value. So there's no loss uh, for the, the constituent rollups to plug into a shared sequencer because whatever value they create goes back to them. Justin, you said that the shared sequencer teams that are building in the space all more or less have had this... Um call it a eureka moment, discovering that perhaps the best way to achieve their goals is to go all the way down to the bottom of the stack and tap into Ethereum itself to achieve some of their goals. And this is how it sounds like that's kind of that's kind of consensus. You're, you're, you're nodding your head. Um, and yeah, then you also invoked eigenlayer and, and restaking, because I think what this is doing is this is increasing the scope of the role of layer one validators. So no longer are Ethereum uh, stakers doing the dumb staking and just proposing blocks. Uh, they are now also taking on additional computational requirements, additional responsibilities. How does this impact the role of a layer one staker, a layer one validator? It, we're increasing its, its duties uh, by a lot, by a little bit. What, what else needs to be, um, what else is being layered onto the responsibilities of a validator to, in order to achieve this? Sounds like they become super validators. Yeah. Well, to, <laughs> to what degree? Like mi mini super validators or big super validators? I think is the big question. Right. Fantastic question. But I just want to close off a, a previous topic around this this roadmap sure. and this intermediate step that Ryan brought forward of of decentralized sequencers. So I used to think that the sequencing, you know, started with base sequencing at L1, and then we move to centralized sequencing, and then we incrementally decentralize. So we go from centralized to federated, and then federated to decentralized. And then eventually, you know, we all do this little dance, and we go back to base sequencing and go full circle. But what I think will happen, more likely than not now, is that we don't need this penultimate step. We don't need the decentralized sequencer. We can go directly to the base sequencer, which happens to also be a, a, a decentralized sequencer. Well, that's faster. Now, yeah, faster yes, progress. We're going faster. We're accelerating. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the to answer your question around, you know, the the requirements of a shared sequencer and of a pre-confirmer. First of all, yes, I want to acknowledge the fact that you need to be sophisticated in order to provide shared sequencing and pre-confirmations. At the very least, you need to have enough bandwidth to cover all the rollups simultaneously. You need to have low latency, you need to have high uptime, you need to have high amounts of capital you know, to provide a thousand ETH of liquidity. 
You also need to protect yourself against denial of service attacks. So you need to shield your IP address and do whatever it takes to, 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 for, for high uptime. Long story short, you need to be sophisticated. But the good news is going back to propose a build separation. Like we have designs out there where we can have the best of both worlds. We can have a validator running on a Raspberry Pi delegate to some sophisticated sequencer the, the heavy lifting so that we get the maximum efficiency of the market in terms of you know, optimal sequencing while retaining the decentralization of, of the, the validators. Now, this goes back a little bit to what I was saying about execution tickets, this future upgrade. Right now, as a layer one proposer, you're doing two things. First of all, you're ensuring censorship resistance. You're making sure that transactions go on chain. And secondly, you're doing the, the, the sequencing part. And what execution tickets is all about is basically saying, hold on, it would actually be cleaner if the validators were only responsible for censorship resistance and didn't do the sequencing part. Instead, you just sell off, you auction off these sequencing slots to the broader market so that you don't even need to delegate, right? You have like a, a direct access to the sequencing slot so that the, the validators don't have to touch it and it's a, a much cleaner segrega segregation of concerns. So uh, understanding the pattern of, of how Ethereum has developed, um, if this uh, um, vision that you have for the future of Ethereum, the based shared sequencing, shared sequencing using the validators happens, uh, it's not going to happen all at once. There's going to be first like one rollup starts to use it, and then two rollups and then three rollups over time. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why I really like this idea is that it really very much fits with um, mine and Ryan's very old idea of the protocol sync thesis, which is, uh, you know, instead of building on proprietary private systems and solutions, we just find the most credibly neutral, most balanced, most decentralized solution uh, in, and foundation to build on. And that really sounds like what why so many of these shared sequencer teams have all kind of discovered to use like, oh, let's go use Ethereum because that is the the foundation, right? That's just skipping down to the bottom of the stack, the most decentralized part of the stack. So that makes sense to me. And over time, slowly more and more and more rollups will start to tap into this power uh, because of there are incentives. Maybe we can talk for a moment about what those incentives actually are. We talked, uh, you, you talked about like why rollups don't want to have a shared sequencer, right? MEV protection, it's easier to bootstrap a layer two, um, you know, it's just security training wheels, it's simple. Um, and I think that kind of makes sense. You know, in the beginning of all chains, all chains start, de start, start centralized, end up decentralized. This is just what we've seen throughout, you know, all of the growth of chains in, in the crypto space. Um, as you know, rollups get their multi provers up and running. They get you know the the super chain has multiple chains up and running. The conversation will start to turn. It's like oh now it's now it's time to start to turn towards the decentralization of the sequencer. Talk about the incentives and the and why it makes more and more sense over time for uh, many many rollups to start to use a decentralized sequencer. As time goes on, like why do the benefits grow? So as you said, like there's going to be this maturation process. We need the multi-provers. We need the encrypted mempools. Um, we need the super transaction, super builder, super searcher, super wallet infrastructure to build out. Um, we also need, you know, the the MEV situation to be solved, either with way better applications that reduce the MEV by an order of magnitude, or with this espresso idea of rebating back the MEV to the to, to the players uh, at play. Uh, but once we once the time is right, there's going to be a tipping point, as you said. And really, you know, the the the, the in economic incentive goes back to what are the L2s selling, right? The L1 is selling data availability. The L2s are selling execution, and they want to maximize the amount of execution that they sell. And in order to maximize that you want to be tapping into a shared sequencer. Now, here, here's, here's the reason why. Let's say that for whatever reason, some rollup, rollup A, Arbitrum, because it starts with A, decides that you know, they, they don't want uh, to, to tap into the, to the shared sequencer. But now what will happen is on, on, on Uniswap, you know, Uniswap will pick whatever sequencer can give you the, the best deal. 
and it will more likely than not happen to be this 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 shared sequencer. And so when the the user presses the buy button, there's going to be execution for all the rollups that number one are part of the shared sequencer, and number two can you know provide some competitively priced liquidity. And even if Arbitrum has like reasonably competitive liquidity, it just won't get tapped into because it's not part of this synchronous zone. And so it's missing out on execution fees. And so the way that you maximize execution fees will be to, to tap into this, 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 uh, this sequencer. Also, just you know, using my intuition to understand how these things have grown in Ethereum, I'm going to guess that the first chain and the, or first you know, handful of chains that adopt a shared sequencer paradigm, a shared sequencer platform, it will be they will be giving up the most and capturing the least because the incentives to join in the shared sequencer uh, structure uh, will be the smallest at the very beginning. But as more and more chains do grow into, I've used this uh, metaphor um, to discuss the Optimism super chain, for example, the Peloton. What is the Peloton? It's the very long uh, line of bicyclists who are all racing together. And joining in the Peloton, you get to draft on others. You contribute to the draft. The Peloton moves very quickly. And if you are a, a, a bicyclist uh, not in the Peloton, you are just taking the headwinds by yourself. You don't get to draft on anyone. Uh, you know, it's all up to you. Uh, and so this is the idea for the growth of the Optimism Super Chain is that, well, the Optimism Collective takes a 15% fee for being a part of the Super Chain. And really the bull or bear case for Optimism is that the value of being inside of the Super Chain is worth the trade-off, worth the cost of the 15%. It sounds like we're actually applying that same sort of model to all of the rollups using uh, the same shared sequencer, where at the very beginning, there are some high costs because the Peloton's small. You know, there's only a few chains that are drafting on each other. Uh, but as more and more chains all start to use the same shared sequencer, they all start to make trades with each other, the liquidity between each other grows, all of a sudden, something's going to invert, right? Where, you know, is standing alone, standing up your own centralized chain that doesn't talk to the other chains is going to be an insane thing to do. Why would you do that when you can just join in the Peloton, join in the network effects, join in the open source, uh, you know, growth of the layer two, the layer two um, uh, network effects? It is this is kind of like my intuition for how this grows? Uh, will you check my? Will you check that understanding for me? Is that correct? Yeah, I I, I think so. Um, now, in terms of specific teams that are looking to do this, like the most obvious one is Tyco, where like from day one they want to launch as a base rollup, you know, and that's likely going to happen in in twenty twenty four. Now, I've in the last few days I've been trying to talk to various rollup teams, uh, and I did manage to talk to to Scroll and and Arbitrum. Now, scroll, you know, I don't want to put words again in their mouth, but at least, you know, some significant subsets of the researchers seem to be appreciating the value of, of base rollup. And this is something that they're seriously considering. Arbitrum is also very interesting because they're partnering with Espresso and Espresso itself is very much interested in, 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 in base sequencing. Now, one of the kind of interesting dynamics that might happen is that the there might be a coalition between the ZK rollups. Because what we're seeing right now is that the ZK rollups are losing in terms of, of TVL, right? You have Arbitrum and, and Optimism that, that, are, that are winning. And so really you need to ask yourself, okay, what is what is the, the superpower? What is the value proposition of, of, uh, of a ZK rollup? And really it's, it's all about fast settlement, right? Because you can have a, a snark come in extremely quickly as opposed to having to wait the, the seven days. Now, if we go back to the middle of our conversation where we're talking about the ingredients required for universal synchronous composability, we need two of them. We need the shared sequencer, but we also need the instant uh, settlement. And the very first rollups that will achieve this instant settlement are going to be the ZK rollups by, necess by necessity. You can't have an optimistic rollup. So what I think might happen is that the ZK rollups all come together and say, hey, we're going to do a coalition because we're losing right now on TVL. And, you know, this is our only way to, 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 to win out. And, you know, it's possible that the optimistic rollups, you know, will come in from day one. It's possible that they'll kind of be forced because of market pressures to join in eventually. I, I don't really know how the future will play out. I mean, there's, there's also a possible future where, you know, the layer one just doesn't win out as a shared sequencer. I do want to acknowledge that. 
But um, I think even if that's the case, there will be some sort of, of winner-take-most shared sequencer uh, that happens at, 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 at layer two. And it's going to be a, you know, a very fascinating space to, to see evolve. One of the really promising things is that the major roll-up ecosystems to date don't seem to indicate that they want to compete on sequencing. So let's take Arbitrum Orbit, for example. Arbitrum Orbit is, is like a 10% fee that you have to pay to use the code. It's a, it's a licensing fee, right? And that has nothing to do with sequencing. It's a, it's a code fee. If you look at Optimism, you know, uh, Base is paying, I believe, a 15% fee to join the law of chains. And what is the law of chains? It's like basically plugging into their governance. And again, governance has nothing to do with sequencing. So that's very, very promising. And then if you look at all the other role ecosystems, I, don't, I haven't seen one of them yet that has like really strongly suggested that you know, they want to charge a fee you know, maybe to have people join their, 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 their shared sequencer. So I think we're moving in the right direction. There's a lot of education to, 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 to be done. And I think market forces will, will, will play out. And like my role in 2024 will be to you know, explore the design space as thoroughly as I can and kind of provide some amount of you know, guidance, I guess, and re research material for whoever wants to, to go build uh, shared sequences. So in, in that, I heard uh, Justin Drake just giving a, a call out to uh, all of the roll-up communities, anybody who's interested in this space to, to reach out to, to him for uh, you know, uh, ideas and, and for, for coordination there. And, and Justin, as we start to draw this to a, a close, just um, you know, some questions. Like one is with respect to the timeline and roadmap. Okay, so you talked about shared sequencing. That, that's like going to happen this year. And I, I want to be clear about the kind of the next level of shared sequencing, which you've called based sequencing, which is just using the Ethereum layer one and the validator set from Ethereum layer one to um, basically provide the, the shared sequencing as well. And you, you said that that second part does not require an Ethereum hard fork, which is uh, you know fantastic news, but also it seems that it would increase the requirements on validators. And I know you mentioned proposer builder separation like PBS, and that hasn't been deployed yet. So are there still things that are kind of required in order to fully realize the based rollup um, like dream here? And what is the timeline or like rough roadmap for, for that if so? Right. So today on mainnet, we do have a form of off-chain PBS called MevBoost. So it's not a fully trustless uh, PBS because you have to trust the relays, um, but it is a form of PBS nonetheless. So as a, as a validator, I don't have to trust the builder. I only have to trust uh, the, the relay. Now, this is an interesting point. Like the, the relays can actually start playing a, a, you know, an accelerationist role for pre-confirmations. Right, and one of the the major um, technical change that needs to happen is for whoever's doing the pre-confirmations to communicate to the builders the pre-confirmations that have happened so far, that the builders can go build blocks that respect those pre-confirmations. So the way that you can think of pre-confirmations is putting a constraint on the top of block or the top of blobs, right? So rollups consume blobs. And then the very first transactions get executed go at the top of the blob. And if you're synchronously composing with the L1, you're going to be consuming the top of the L1 block. And so really what we want to be doing is for the shared sequencer and pre-confirmer to communicate all these constraints to the builders and for the builders to create the, the best block. Now, one of the interesting economic points here is you might ask, hold on, if I have all these constraints on block building, the builders are going to be building a suboptimal block, one that doesn't extract the most amount of, of, of value. And you know, the, the validators will be disincentivized to provide pre-confirmations because it reduces the amount of MEV. But actually, what we can do is we can price pre-confirmations appropriately. So when a user asks for a pre-confirmation, there's a corresponding pre-confirmation tip Right? You can think of it like the inclusion tip. It's a value that gets paid to the validator. Now, 
economically speaking, what is a pre-confirmation? It's a future on you know, block space execution. It's a future on execution. And so if, for example, a Uniswap trade were to decrease the expected amount of MEV at the end of the, the slot for the validator, then that needs to be compensated for via the pre-confirmation tip. And vice versa, if a user is making a transaction which increases the arbitrage opportunity because they're buying kind of against the market, then the, ironically, the, the user can expect to be paid. It can, it can expect a negative pre-confirmation tip from the validator because now the validator is incentivized to pre-confirm because they, they have more MEV at the end of their slot. So one of the other interesting things is that the pre-confirmer needs to be savvy from a market perspective. They need to be aware of the various DeFi markets and they need to be able to price these futures properly. And this is where, again, like the relays can come in because they're sophisticated or the builders can come in or some sophisticated entity can help out. Justin, one thing I want to clarify is um, you said somewhere in the last you know, a few minutes of conversation that it could be the case that that based rollups, that is using Ethereum uh, shared sequencing, doesn't actually take off. That That's not kind of the, the market uh, equilibrium. The market goes and just does regular non, non-based non uh, rollups or non-using you know, Ethereum as a shared sequencer and, and solves it that way. But um, from kind of the articulation, I, I know that that you're more hopeful of uh, the, the based uh, rollup type of future, but like it, to me, it doesn't make sense why that wouldn't happen. Like, but what are some reasons why base rollups might not work out? You know, maybe we just stop before we start using Ethereum L1 for shared sequencing. Uh, like, why, why, why would that happen? So, I mean, I would say that I have something like eighty percent confidence that you know base sequencing will will win out. Um, but I do want to leave the possibility that I'm wrong, especially that it's it's so early days. One of the very interesting points that was brought up by the Arbitrum team on their call um, was that they have very fancy strategies to compress data. Uh, And one of the things that they do, which I didn't realize, is that they have this machine learning algorithm, which watches the the change of uh, base fee. And then whenever the machine learning algorithm believes that the base fee is like very, very high, Uh, it will just forego, it will just wait. It just won't settle immediately. It will wait a few slots for the gas price to go back down. And that allows users to enjoy lower fees uh, on on Arbitrum. Oh, wow. And it turns out that this like little technical detail is like somewhat incompatible with with base sequencing. And now I want to go talk to all these teams and I want to kind of collect all these little, you know, nitty gritty technical details and try and see what we can do and, and try and understand them better. But, you know, m- macro picture, like I am very bullish. I mean, w- one of the things that's surprising is that we can or we always find improvements. Like if you had asked me, you know, two years ago, um, is the Ethereum, you know, roadmap complete? And I would have said, yes, you know, that's the, the, the best that we know. But it, it turns out that we, we constantly make improvements. So, yes, it is like as a snapshot of 2024, like this is the best we can even imagine. But who knows? Uh, you know, in the, over the next half decade, decade, if we're going to find uh, more more crazy things. One one of the things, for example, that I only realized a few months ago, which kind of completely blew my mind, is this cryptographic primitive called one shot signatures. It's a signature scheme where the private key can only be used once, so you can only sign a message once, and then it destroys itself. And it turns out that this is just impossible with classical cryptography because you can always copy the private key. But if you kind of expand your model a little bit, if you use quantum mechanics and your private key is a quantum superposition that destroys itself as soon as you observe it, 
then now suddenly you can have one-shot signatures. And it turns out that one-shot signatures completely transform the end game of consensus. And that's, you know, for a completely different episode. But to just to to point out that like the the crazy sci-fi um you know crypto economics just keeps on giving um and it, it's very difficult to to know when, when it will stop ryan asked if this uh shared sequencing using layer one validators if that gets us to universal uh synchronous composability it it doesn't get us all the, all the way there at genesis correct it provides the foundation for it and then there's a bunch of you know private market aftermarket innovations that also needs to develop in order to get us the rest of the way right so shared sequencing uh, gets us the foundation the clay for the rest of the market to take it the rest of the way is that correct yes that's correct and one of the things that that we've observed is that um sophisticated entities like searchers and builders are very very good at that job actually like their livelihood depends on it. And the reason is that it's this cutthroat market where only the most efficient survive. And so if you're not like squeezing every little drop of, of MEV and value and, and you know, optimal sequencing, then, then you, you lose out. And so the great thing is that base sequencing is actually the simplest form of sequencing. It's the one where you have to do nothing, right? You're reusing existing infrastructure and you just let the market do its thing. Um, and it's actually, in some sense, simpler than centralized sequencing, right? Because centralized sequencing, first of all, you have to you know, do the DevOps to maintain the centralized sequencer. And, you know, these roll-up teams, they're not DevOps experts. And, you know, the, the shared sequencers actually go down and things like that. But also, just from a contract, uh, smart contract perspective, the smart contract has to verify the signature coming from uh, from the centralized sequencer, whereas base sequencing is literally like anyone can just can just build a block. It's 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 in some sense a zero line of code sequencing mechanism. And so, if we had these fault lines, this fragmentation, this this fracturing that, that we started the episode with, right? What you're describing is kind of how Ethereum heals itself, and it's kind of a you know a, a self healing. And um, I think what you're saying, Justin, is that is starting now. Right, like that is basically this year that process is starting. I don't know if you can predict how long it will take to have, say, you know, universal synchronous composability across, you know, seventy percent of the super transactions you know, that we're doing. Is is that going to play out over like a decade? Are we talking about months and years here? Are we talking about like a one to three year timeline? And we have, for all intents and purposes pretty much universal synchronous composability for the the majority of the ethereum economy right um i mean i i would say not decades not months but some something like years like one two three years does sound correct um we do have a lot on our plate right we have to solve security of rollups we need these multi-provers we need to solve mev we need encrypted mempools we need to solve uh, real-time settlements, which means real-time proving, which means like better proof systems. We you know even need hardware acceleration of these proofers. We need better applications that don't leak so much MEV to the sequencer. Um, there's there's gonna be a, a lot going on, and you know we're we're talking at least one year. You know likely you know two years, three years until we get to this this full vision. But you know the Ethereum community. I think has several qualities. Like one of them is that we don't want to take shortcuts. Another one of them is that we're, we're patient. And so if we can like set this North star um, and kind of just work towards this as a community, I think it's going to be uh, you know a, a extremely rewarding. And going back to the narratives and and the memetics and the and the culture, like having this shared sense of mission and this this shared vision i think will will help heal um so, some some of the the strifes that we've seen uh, at at the social layer well it sounds like a decently ambitious roadmap which is nothing that we've ever seen before in ethereum we've never seen an ambitious roadmap before we've never come across anything like this we don't know how to do that uh <laughs> right, justin you talked about like all of the different uh components uh that need to come together 
um, both just in the roll-up stack, but then even post uh, universal shared composability. Um, a lot of these things are already being built in parallel. Uh, I, I, there's one question I want to ask you is what accessory technologies will help once we have the shared sequencing base, what, what accessory technologies comes after to help compose all the layer twos? And these are probably, I'm guessing, technologies like Intense, restaking from Eigenlayer, bridges like Across. There's a bunch of you know projects that already exist, already have some of the solutions. It, they just never had the base to be built on. Uh, and so even though it seems like a decently ambitious roadmap, again, nothing we've ever not seen before in Ethereum, uh, it kind of also seems a lot of these solutions have already been um, been being, being built in Ethereum over the, the last few years. So wh what are those accessory technologies that will help with universal shared composability? Uh, and uh, so what else is being, being built in parallel here? Right. So a big one, as you said, is intents and account abstraction and order flow auctions. These are all related concepts. Um, these are you know, user-facing tools to express yourself. It's possible that actually they won't be completely user-facing in the sense that my personal belief is that you know, the user needs to almost not think about the intent. The intent needs to be implicit. And oftentimes there's this kind of this master intent, which is just, just give me the best execution, like give me the, the best deal out there. Um, and I think what we're going to start seeing, for example, is uh, wallets, you know, maybe like MetaMask, that are going to have two buttons. Button number one is do this transaction as requested by the user. And then button number two is get to the same goal, you know, basically try and understand what the intent of the user is with that transaction and give me an extra hundred dollars because, you know, the searchers were really good at squeezing the best opportunity and crafting a better transaction than what you could have crafted on, 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 on your own. And once we have basically wallets integrating with, with these intents and these order flow auctions, um, just because of the incentives, right, you'll get paid to transact on Ethereum in, in, in some sense. Um, another thing that we need is, um, you know, additional slashing conditions on, on validators. And that's very much related to, to Eigenlayer and, and, and restaking. Now, for example, Espresso, one of the things that they're doing is they want to increase the economic security of the pre-confirmation to millions of ETH. And in order to do that, they, 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 they use restaking. So they have these each 32E validator can provide individual um, you know, collateral at stake. One of the things that I do want to highlight is that 32E is probably insufficient for the, the one layer one proposer who's acting as the shared sequencer for that 12 seconds. I think we want something closer to 1000 ETH. And the reason is that you need to think about the incentive for the, the, the sequencer to renege on all their promises. And if, if a sequencer reneges on all their promises, they have the full freedom to build whatever block they want, right? They're now suddenly unconstrained. And then you can ask yourself, okay, what is the value of building an unconstrained block? And that's basically the amount of MEV that you can grab in any given slot. And historically speaking, we haven't had more than a thousand ETH of MEV in any given slot. So if you're collateralized with a thousand ETH, you'll never have an incentive, or in, only in extreme situations, you'll have the incentive to renege on your pre-confirmations. And then I think the, the last piece of the puzzle is like this really hardcore engineering around you know, recursive proofs and folding and you know, accelerating algorithms like fast Fourier transforms and you know, MSMs like multi-scalar multiplications, and then programming like really advanced hardware like FPGAs and, and GPUs, and even building your own ASIC in order to get to this real-time uh, settlement. And there's, there's a lot of teams out there um, that are you know, looking to do this. Actually, this is, this is a topic that I was very much interested in. And you know, in the ecosystem, there's about 10 different companies uh, that are that are trying to, to achieve this acceleration. Previously, I used to think that the main value of doing hardware acceleration is that you can have proving at home, right? So you can have decentralized proving. You don't need a data center in order to become a prover. But now I've changed a little bit. There's actually two value propositions to these ASICs. One is decentralization, of course, but the other one is low latency proving. Justin, this has been a you know fantastic conversation, and you once again you've kind of 
uh, given us uh, a world class education. And I, I got to say, for, for folks who haven't listened to previous Justin Drake podcasts, and particularly on Bankless, this man's predictions tend uh, to come true uh, and tend to become reality. And is hasn't missed not yet. And as we've heard throughout this this conversation, one phrase uh, I'm reminded of: we got an entire ecosystem working on this solution. Don't bet against Ethereum. I don't think that bet has ever worked out uh, ever for works. anyone who yeah. says that oh, Ethereum can't frick, fix its fragmentation because X, Y, Z. All right. I wouldn't bet against that. Um, as we draw this to a close, maybe, Justin, my, my, my last question is around this. So much of the Bankless podcast has been trying to figure out what block space actually is. Certainly what crypto assets are, <laughs> but also what block space itself is. And I've seen kind of this evolution of what uh, Ethereum block space, at least on the layer one, actually does and what it contains. And again, this is like when you boil it all down to what is crypto creating, it's creating a new digital commodity called block space. And uh, you know, that we've done tons of episodes on this. But now the evolution of Ethereum block space, it sounds like we've certainly talked about it moving to settlement and data availability for chains. And now it's unleashed maybe a new role at what you're talking about here, which is also sequencing for chains. And I, I suppose that is the function of layer one block space. I mean, we could talk about in the, the full vision of everything you laid out. I mean, we've talked about what users get out of it, how builders and searchers evolve and how validators uh, evolve and how rollups uh, evolve and, and change. But what about block space, Ethereum block space? Does it become settlement and DA? Does it become sequencing for all of the chains? Is that its role as a commodity? Right. So I think what you're pointing out to is that block space is a is a complex thing which has multi, multiple constituent components to it. One of them is data availability. Another one is settlement. Another one is sequencing. And yet another one is execution. And I think one of the nice things about the, 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 the modular thesis is that we can try and tackle each one of them in individually and you know, really optimize, optimize for each. Now, one of the advantages of the monolithic thesis is that you know, all of these are under one shared, shared um, um, umbrella. And the, the nice thing about Ethereum is that we can start tapping into both, both of these. And you know, maybe one word that you could say kind of unites both is the integrated thesis, right? We have modular components, but they're all integrated under one umbrella. Now, one of the interesting things is, you know, can you start providing uh, shared sequencing without necessarily sharing the data availability layer. And I think the answer is, is yes, but it's not as, as, as clean necessarily. So for example, what you can start uh, doing is having validiums and optimiums, you know, start plugging in uh, to, to this shared sequencer, but now you start entering edge cases. Okay, what if one chain reverts, but not, not, not the other? Um, and this brings us to, to the concept of, of shared security. Right? There's this very nice thing that when you're under one umbrella, you're, you're sharing security. It's not like you have multiple modules and you base, your, your net security is the security of the weakest link. Right? And so I think one, one of the, the value propositions of Ethereum is that it gives you the option to minimize your security assumptions. Right? Security assumptions are a bad thing. You don't want to have too many of them. The more you buy into security assumptions, the more brittle your system becomes. And one of the things that I'm hopeful of is that the real bottleneck fundamentally for scalability is, 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 is data availability. And I'm hopeful that this will largely go, go away as, as a bottleneck. I'm hopeful that eventually Ethereum can be the data availability for, for, for the whole world. And the, the way that I think about it here is... Um, in terms of going beyond full dank sharding, right? Full dank sharding somehow presupposes that, you know, we've reached the end game, it's, it's full dank sharding. But actually what we're having is we have a law called Nielsen's law, which basically says that 
the amount of bandwidth grows 50% per year. And the, there's, there's good reasons to believe that Nielsen's law will, will continue for a long time, you know, at least a decade, maybe several decades. And part of the reason is that bandwidth is this embarrassingly parallel thing, right? You can just send more photons through, just have more, more, you know, more fiber optic cables. I mean, it turns out that a single fiber optic cable can go, can have like an insane amount of information pass through it. So you don't even, you don't even need that. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that with clever engineering, a lot of the bottlenecks that we're suffering today, things like uh, disk IO on, on GEF, things like state bloat, things like verification of execution, all of these things go away and you, you're kind of left with the one fundamental bottleneck, which is bandwidth. And when you combine Deng Sharding with Nielsen's law that compounds over 10 years, we're in a position, we'll be in a position where we can do 10 million transactions per second on Ethereum. It sounds insane, but this is where we're, where we're heading, 10 million transactions per second. And that's enough for every single person on earth to do 100 transactions per day. In my opinion, this, you know, that's enough, right? And so we'll be in a position where the whole internet of value can be in one place with shared security. Under the hood, there's these modules, but these are integrated modules. And we only buy into one security assumption, which is that Ethereum is secure. And this brings us to you know, trying to grow the economic security of Ethereum. Right now, we are at $70 billion, which is extremely good. It's 29 million ETH times the price of ETH. But you know, I'm hopeful that we'll get to a trillion dollar of economic security or even trillions of dollars, at which point you know, we'll have unquestionable security even against nation states. And we'll be in a position where you know, the internet of value is unquestionably secure and it's just unquestionably the, the place where everything happens. Well, uh, what a fantastic vision, Justin. Thank you for guiding us through it. I, I can tell you once we have shared sequencing on Ethereum, uh, its base level, I, I can't wait to start calling it super block space on Ethereum because it will be deserving of its prefix. Justin, thank you so super much blocks. for yeah, super blocks. Thank you so much for guiding us through this conversation today. It's been fantastic. Thanks, guys. Thankless Nation, we have some Justin Drake episodes from the archives in the show notes. Go check them out if you haven't already. Also, got to end with this. Of course, crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. It's the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. 